Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, the Enter Gallery, Ice Capades and Pushing Buttons. An online show says art is not just for the rich. Then we see how the biggest carousel in Finland was built. And a Russian collector has her finger on the button. Some are even hundreds of years old. An organization in Amsterdam says traditional galleries are holding artists back and are hoarding art for the rich. The group is called START and with its latest project, the goal is to break down barriers. Upcoming Start's digital upcoming show. digital show features emerging artists, live debates and interviews about the current state of the art world. Set for later this month, it hopes to get everyday people more comfortable with experiencing and owning art. And in the meantime, the platform itself has a vision of renewing the art market and providing a free space for artists to develop themselves and connect with buyers. Let's talk to the founder of Start, Carlo Tossi. Hi, welcome to Showcase. It's lovely to have you with us today. So, um, the, the immediate question that comes to my mind is that what is the difference uh, between an affordable art fair, an affordable art gallery and what you're doing? Because you say that you're completely against the gallery system, but what you do actually kind of reminds me of affordable art galleries. Yeah, it, it is in a certain way it could remind uh, about the affordable art gallery, but the concept of gallery is uh, uh, what we do without. Uh, uh, it's been art, uh, it's been for uh, too long uh, a, a monopoly just of uh, an elite of people uh, and uh, except for certain moments in which there are these uh, huge affordable art fairs in which you see like crowds of people going and trying to buy art. Uh, what we do is uh, the following equation. Instead of uh, uh, bringing people to galleries, we bring the art to people's house. So, uh, for example, this uh, um, art digital show we are uh, I'm promoting today is exactly that. Uh, we will showcase for three days uh, our artists uh, bringing them to everyone, uh, whoever uh, <laughs> uh, downloads the, uh, and gets uh, online with it, uh, for and showing artists uh, in a very, very uh, unorthodox way, uh, unconventional, with music, with a, a whole creative direction uh, behind it to, uh, to show them uh, and make them uh, uh, possible and portable uh, to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I, I believe in, uh, in knowledge, in awareness, but in a very uh, simple way. Uh, I, we want to reach, starts wants to reach uh, the, uh, uh, the normal person, someone that is, has always been reluctant in buying art okay. and... Uh, and, and, and develop the artists at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is very interesting and I really appreciate the young and fresh voices. So, you know, uh, good luck with, with the exhibition and the new initiative. But please do explain to me uh, what is difference in what you're doing and how you're conducting your, uh, your um, you know, uh, business. How is it different from a gallery? Because what a gallery does is that yes. they represent artists they sell yes. their works to people who are interested in art. So what you're doing is, in mentality, not very different, is it? Well, I think, uh, I believe it is. Because, uh, as you said, uh, a gallery uh, takes the artist, um, e exhibits the artist's work for a, a, um, an amount, uh, some, uh, some, a period of time, and then, uh, and then it's finished. Then there is no uh, uh, relation, uh, further relations between the parties. What we do with the artists is uh, something uh, uh, concerning development. We work with the artist. We develop the artist through workshops. We have a whole team of curators who uh, have a, a continuous relation with the artists, with our artists. Uh, we 
um, promote them in our international events for free. Uh, we, and then obviously we do all the uh, marketing, uh, social media, uh, uh, press, uh, so publications on, on magazines. Uh, and th this is all services we provide for free. So we believe a lot in the development uh, of the artists. We just don't, uh, and, and we never let go of, of our artists. We keep on working with them. Mm -hmm. I believe this is a, 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 a point uh, uh, important uh, because it uh, uh, creates a, a sort of trust uh, relation, uh, almost a friend relation between uh, us and the artist and, uh, and, and gives a chance to the artist to be actually an artist in the meantime. They can just keep on experimenting themselves in developing their style because we do the rest. Mm -hmm. And we are growing a lot, gaining a lot of, of uh, trust and confidence from our artists. Okay, so what I understand from what you said is that you really don't think galleries do that for artists, so that's something you're trying to change in the system. So tell us yes. what you think is uh, wrong in the art system right now. As I said, the art system, it's just uh, based uh, on an elite of uh, people. Uh, the language the art, the art system speaks, it's uh, most of the time uh, difficult to comprehend for normal people. It's just uh, uh, the, the galleries uh, pick up artists, then they they uh, they push them up when uh, when uh, when needed, and then they just abandon them. So there is uh, uh, there is no follow up really, and uh, the art system is based on certain uh, um, judgment uh, parameters, which I are uh, to to me uh, fictitious and have been uh, developed. Uh, uh, during these years, uh, only based on uh, business-oriented uh, pr perspectives, let's say, uh, without discovering the real uh, uh, value of, our, of artists and art. Uh, this is the reason why we, we, are, we, are, we are never going to be a gallery, but we are a factory. A factory mm. like... Uh, <laughs> Actually, go, sorry to, to cut you off there, but I really wanted to ask you about the factory as well, because you, this yes. is a uh, year... So basically, you're going to have the exhibition plus music and some uh, sort of entertainment in what you call the factory. Uh, it is an imaginary room, I assume, with a reference to Andy Warhol. So tell me why yes. the reference to Andy Warhol in particular. <laughs> yes, because the, I always had, uh, I, w I always thought that the 70s and the world uh, were uh, uh, an age of uh, enormous peak of creativity in development. And uh, as a result of that, Warhol created uh, uh, a factory which was like uh, an industry, an incubator of talent uh, uh, and uh, and show and uh, and music. Uh, and th so this is what this is exactly what we want to do. This is exactly what uh, the art the art factory art digital show is gonna is gonna show. It's gonna we are. It's gonna be like a, 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 um, a concert of uh, art. Uh, uh, we will showcase. Uh, uh, five uh, um, of our artists and with with uh, mixed with music openers uh, and uh, with uh, with um, uh, special effects uh, to make it appealing to everyone mm -hmm. and and to make it something that could uh, really be watched uh, from anyone sitting on their sofa, especially in this uh, uh, particular period of time in which people are uh, mostly yeah. home. Yeah. All right. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Carlo Tosi, yes. it was good to have you on our show today. In October 2020, Miami-based art collector Pablo Rodriguez Frail spent almost $67,000 on a 10-second video that he could have watched for free online. Last week, he sold it for $6.6 .6 million. Here's why. 
In October of 2020, a 10-second piece of video art of what appears to be a giant Donald Trump collapsed on the ground and covered in slogans amid an otherwise idyllic setting was purchased by Miami-based art collector Pablo Rodriguez Frail for $67,000. Last week, he sold it for $6.6 million. The video by digital artist Beeple, whose real name is Mike Winkleman, was authenticated by blockchain, which serves as a digital signature to certify who owns it and that it is the original work. It's a new type of digital asset, known as a non-fungible token, or NFT, that has exploded in popularity as enthusiasts and investors scramble to spend enormous sums of money on items that only exist online. Rodriguez Frail explained what he thinks set this piece of digital content apart and made it worth its hefty price tag. You can go into, into the loop and take a picture of the Mona Lisa and you can have it there, but it doesn't have any value because uh, it, it doesn't have the provenance or the history of the work. Again, the reality here is that this is very, very valuable because of who is behind. It's a full career of a multi like a generation career in this space and being the best of the best. Examples of NFTs range from digital artworks and sports cards to pieces of land in virtual environments. The start of the rush for NFTs has been linked with the launch of the NBA's Top Shot website which allows users to buy and trade NFTs in the form of video highlights of games. Five months after its launch, the platform says it has over 100,000 buyers and nearly $250 million in sales. The majority of sales take place in the site's peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, with the NBA getting a royalty on every transaction. Nate Hart is a Nashville-based NFT investor who says he bought a LeBron James Cosmic NFT on NBA Top Shot for $40,000 in January, then sold it for $125,000 in February. The hype is extremely high right now. I, I've used the analogy a couple times that you know, early NFT guys are in in a way kind of being have have kind of been presented with the same opportunity as maybe people who found Bitcoin early. Investors caution, however, that while big money is flowing into NFTs, the market could represent a price bubble. Like many new niche investment areas, there is the risk of major losses if the hype dies down, while there could be prime opportunities for fraudsters in a market where many participants operate under pseudonyms. Still, auction house Christie's has just launched its first ever sale of digital art, a collage of 5,000 pictures, also by Beeple, which exists solely as an NFT. Noah Davis is a contemporary art expert at Christie's. And we were at a million dollars in 10 minutes, at, with, with a starting bid at $100. And that, that just truly is, we've never seen anything even remotely close to that kind of activity. Bids for the work have hit $3 million, with the sale due to close on March 11th. A former NASA engineer has built the world's biggest ice carousel, not once or twice, but four times. The thing is, his record keeps getting broken, and he keeps the cycle going around and around. Let's go to Finland for the story. This is Yanni Capuleto. He wants to reclaim the record of building the world's biggest ice carousel. So he and his team have been carving out a more than 300 meter wide spinning disc. It's powered by a boat motor and has to complete a full rotation to claim the world record. We are trying to build the world's largest ice carousel. I have done the world's largest ice carousel four times, uh, but Currently, the record uh, is uh, held by my friend Chuck Zwilling from Minnesota, United States. He made an, an ice carousel of diameter of 228 meters, and we are trying to make even bigger. Capuleto is a renewable energy specialist. His creations wears awareness about green energy, like his floating sauna from 2018. It was powered by solar energy and sailed 90 kilometers from Helsinki to Tallinn. My friend Yanni Capiletto, he and his wife, they did at their summer cottage, evidently in the winter, but at the summer cottage, they made a circle in the ice and made it spinning around. And from that, everything has been spinning bigger and bigger. 
But this time around, Papileto is taking things to the next level by inventing special devices to cut a perfect circle. This is, this is an attempt, and, uh, but things have been uh, proceeding well. We have uh, many people using chainsaws and the two of the cutting devices which I built, the Hurricane or the Red Devil, um, it works just great. And the measurements have to be precise for the disc to be able to rotate successfully. Nothing in the world is perfect, but the ice cutter cell has to be perfect, because if it's not perfectly round, it does not go around. So it has to be measured precisely, then it has to be opened precisely. And here was the big problem that we had 40 centimeters of snow. And so 40 centimeters of heavy snow had to be taken away with, by hand, by tractor, with other, with other things, and then there had to be a, a new measurement made. The project was commissioned by the local authorities of Lapajari, who wanted to raise awareness about how climate change is shortening the winters in the Nordic country. This is a little bit str strange because we have a very small, small municipalities and this kind of thing. So, so uh, I think about that we have to make something big, something uh, things a little bit different than other municipalities or cities. Capuleto's world records don't last very long. It was just last year that he won a fourth title. And if he's successful this time, his victory will probably be short-lived. Buttons are just tiny, ordinary items, right? Well, one Russian woman is obsessed with them. Here's a look at her massive collection. These German ivory buttons were painted in a special technique and there are only seven of them left in the whole world. Natalia Pristankova feels lucky to own three of them, but there's so much more to her collection that includes pieces that go back centuries. Pristankova is an art expert whose fascination with buttons started 16 years ago. Back then she collected bells. And lo and behold, she found a button that made a sound like a bell. Pristankova's world was rocked and she started collecting thousands of buttons. If you start learning the history of buttons, it's in fact the history of people, the history of fashion, art, techniques and processing methods of different materials. It's like a museum in miniature. Just like on only this card there can be a whole museum, because there are absolutely different techniques here. Pristankova often competes at auctions to buy the most unusual and rare additions to her collection. They have cost her up to $2,000. You buy good, interesting buttons one at a time, waiting for them sometimes for years. I still have some buttons in mind, which I don't yet have, but I'm waiting to find them. I think they'll come up because 16 years ago I didn't even dream of having those buttons that I currently have in my collection. Her only complaint is that there aren't enough catalogues and books about Russian buttons, like there are for English or French. That's why she thinks it's important to have exhibitions. So far, she's had five. And when she's not putting on a display, she's posting about them on Instagram. You could say that she's really buttoning up the market. Shortlists have come out for nine Oscars categories, and British Palestinian filmmaker Farah Nabulsi is on there for best live action short film. Here's a look at her movie called The Present. I need toilet paper, lemons. What we have here? Take out the cheese, move now! My house, it's just there. 
A far more harsh circumstance than actually presented in the film is a young man I've gotten to know over the years, and he lives in Hebron. And he lives on a road, quite literally, where 80 meters from his house is a checkpoint. No matter where he wants to go, what he wants to do, who he wants to see, what he wants to get, he goes through a checkpoint, as does any other Palestinian on that road. So it's a far harsher, actually, circumstance than what was presented in the film. So, no, the present is, is based on a reality. It, it, it is, there is no sensationalism in it. There are stories that are far more harsh than what is presented in the film. After spending a century behind closed doors, the public will get to see a painting of a Paris street scene by Vincent van Gogh. Take a look. The tableau is a véritable redécouverte in the sense. The painting is a true rediscovery, meaning that although it has been published in comprehensive catalogs, it has never reappeared on the market since the day it was acquired by the family who owns it. We think as a modest estimate that it is between 5 to 8 million euros, that's an estimation that serves as a starting point, but the market will tell us how much it will cost in the end. Russia's famous Bolshoi Theater is trying to brighten the winter blues away. It's putting on a one-act opera, Salome, by German composer Richard Strauss. Take a listen. Salome is a very modern psychology because it um, tries to look into the mind of a woman and is looking of, uh, at her development from a young girl to somebody who notices that she has to free herself from influences. Classical music lovers need not despair despite closed concert halls across Germany. Folks in Frankfurt who are hungry for culture can now call a concert instead of a pizza. Hello, the music is We perform staircase concerts, we play miniature concerts in people's homes for about 10 minutes and we deliver along a route in our neighborhood so that people can enjoy some live music. In the summer there are often street concerts right outside our door. The last summer my wife and I came across the Chamber Philharmonic Orchestra which performed in the street while we were on the walk in our district of Bockenheim. So I thought if you could order them we would do just that. Banksy alert. We may have yet another street art sighting in the UK. Let's take a look.
it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter account have more from the world of arts and culture. I'm Ilf Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Bye.